for getting to order. We start with the roll call. Uh, uh, Michelle Roth, present. Forkett or Alderon. Robert Davidson is not able to join us yet. Ralph Groswald. Here. Daniel Leonard. Uh, Ethan and Mary, I'm hoping you're on their way. Um, actually, Robert's not going to be able to join us at all today. He's out of town this week. So, um, Lisa Knobloch? Here. Um, Francie Jaffe? Here. Susan Bartlett? Here. Daryl Hahn? Yes. And Heather McIntyre is here. Councilmember Martin is coming as well today. So, um, we'll see when she gets here. Ethan is here now. So, Cherry Oakworm? Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, we acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living spiritual connection that the first peoples have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that happened when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. And we have our inclusion statement as well. The Sustainability Advisory Board embraces diverse perspectives from its members and the public to create an inclusive space where everyone feels welcome to share their opinion. The board asks that all attendees listen and speak with respect and avoid attack on individuals or specific group identities. Uh, so the first item we have is the approval of the minutes from last month. And adjustments to those. Open it like a motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Or abstain? Ethan, did you open the group? Okay. Um, do we have any agenda revisions? No. I just I have one thing to add during um from the board, which is about the um, you could just bring that and help me with that. Yeah. Um, okay, so the main Topic we had today was actually the uh, draft discussion letter that Ethan has written for the Flat River IRP. So I was thinking we overall need to vote if we do want the letter to come from our from the Sustainability Advisory Board. And if we do vote for that, then we would work on what exactly it does say. Good question. And it's sort of a procedural question. This is a, uh, I had a chance to, to read through this. I want to thank Ethan for a heroic effort in putting this together. And it certainly raises concerns for me um, I'm a little worried because it's very dense, but there's a lot of very important information I've talked with Ethan about seeing ways that we can try to condense it a little bit without losing the impact. But whether or not it might make sense to have a board member, if we do decide to move forward, whether it would be appropriate to have a board member go to city council and present it and give a little background that's a little more of a summary uh, so that they're not just handed a very dense and very complicated, but very important document. So maybe it's premature to bring this up because maybe the board won't vote to move forward on it. I support uh, moving forward. I think that the city council should be aware of the information that's in here, at least to explore some of the very important points that have been brought up. But I'm a little concerned that we'll give them this very complex document It'll go to somebody's desk and they'll look at it with all the other commitments they have and it won't have the impact that it could have and what is the reason for this initiative. So I just had a question about, about that. So I guess I'll think both to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if the board does vote to submit a letter to city council, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach that. 
Uh, we can work through Council Member Martin to bring something forward to Council as our representative or a liaison for the Sustainability Advisory Board and bring it to Council's attention and it'll be up to them to determine if they want to put something on a future agenda to discuss that further. We can submit you know, a memo that goes in the Council packets for their meeting that talks about the background and provides the letter or I can work with the um, leadership to put something on the agenda as well. So there's a few different ways that we can approach it depending on what the board decides to do and probably look for some guidance from Council Member Martin based on the history of the IRP and coming to Council and all of the engagement that's happened to date with that and where things are at currently. Um, I know we say this is the last time a board uh, brought forward a, a significant resolution probably was the airport sustainability mm -hmm. uh, resolution uh, and uh, in that case um, although I had a lot to do with the initiation of that resolution because I'm the liaison to the airport advisory board um, but the chair and I think another member uh, of the advisory board as well although it's you know, it was more than a year, it was almost two years yeah, ago. Um, uh, did did speak to the letter before the before the council, and and, and that's um, a preferred way of doing it because then they they get to um, uh, ask questions, and uh, there are very few. Um, members of the board that have a lot of technical background. So, um, you know, it's just the way it is. They, they look on questions to ask. Did the advisory board itself write that resolution for the airport? Um, they took a lot of, it, 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 it had many authors. Yeah. So, um, John Grunsfeld, the astronaut, bases his company out of Vance Brand. Uh, and I drafted the original draft that then went through the sustainability yeah. department and they added some stuff to it, plus a lot of which came back out when the board saw it because they felt that the resolution was more prescriptive than uh, really was the business of council. And the length of this uh, is uh, indicates that, that that may be a a shortcoming of this one as well, and it probably needs to be advised, uh, revised to be more brief and also to read to remove some, some technical problems that this draft has. Um, and I'm sorry, I was traveling, uh, so I haven't read the whole thing. If you bear with me, I would like to let you go ahead with the discussion. There, just don't get down. Marcia, do you want to borrow my computer? And you, can uh, you know, I I have one. I just I just traded mine out. So yeah, if, if you don't want to, yeah. This is a loaner, and I don't know where anything is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So right. to Oh, okay. It won't take me that long to read. Yeah. What did you? Yeah, that's nice. Oh. <laughs> that's so fancy. Um, well, the first part of the introduction covers the three pillars of PRPA, which are reliability, finance sustainability, and uh, environmental responsibility. And it briefly outlines a few concerns with each of those pillars that the IRP puts at risk. And then goes into a number of more specific concerns, including addressing dark calm and the risk of hail damage to the solar farm in Mandel County, which is in the middle of Hale Alley. Um, financial and uh, hydrogen that we may not consider all possible energy portfolios, which is one of the requirements. 
of the IRP. And uh, I'm sure that there may not have been enough community input in the long run because there's only one community listen, listening session that was held here and was not very well attended. That was last November. That is one of the requirements as well for robust community participation. Would, sorry to interrupt, but would you say that they're relying on projections of the new technologies is suspect and what rides on things that there's not a huge amount of substance to that? It will actually be achievable. I'm far from an expert in hydrogen, but my understanding is that it's optimistic. The production of the IRP are optimistic. And we did. So let's go to a presentation about hydrogen in Boulder. That was what the experts said there, that it still has a long way to go before it's commercially available at a utility scale. That was at NOAA, and it was um, Gary Ellis, and he's the US, Geo US Geological Survey um, sort of a pointy expert for um, studying the potentials for hydrogen to come online. and. Um, when we asked the question, if you think of the fact that the internal combustion engine was invented in 1853, and by 1953, everyone was driving, you know, their Pontiacs, where are we with hydrogen? He laughed and he said, we're at 1850. So it was very disturbing to hear in that conversation that no part of the supply chain has been worked out. They don't know how to find it well, they don't know how to source it, they don't know how to transport it. They don't know how to burn it without making whatever they burn it in brittle. Um, they don't know which forms to do it in, whether it's liquid hydrogen or you know, gaseous. It's so, um, that was very concerning to me when I saw that IRP is that most optimistic projections means you can write anything you want to because I think what this means is that I, uh, PRP is in kind of a hard place because there's no pressure to go. 100% carbon neutral, and I don't think it's possible yet. Yeah. And so I almost feel like this letter is sort of giving the PRP a chance to step back and say to the cities who are thinking of putting pressure on them, yeah, we need to actually take a closer look, and you may be disappointed with what we have. Um, I'd like to make a comment on the in your interpretation of that NOAA, because there are actually um, several proposals about uh, what called renewable natural gas in specific. There's green natural gas and there's blue natural gas. And some of the things that you said are about blue, if they're accurate at all. Um, so green natural gas is not typically transported at all. It's um, it is made on site by electrolysis, which means you don't have a mining problem, and your storage problem is reduced because it's made on site. And that doesn't mean that it's the storage of hydrogen is an easy thing, but it's but on site when you don't have to transport it, it is uh, easier. And there are specific to the PRPA applications. I'm, I think it's in. Mexico, but I'd have to look it up. That computer just lost its mind. Um, so, uh, but there are instances of gray natural gas as um, uh, backup uh, dispatchable energy being constructed by utilities now um, and in places where the water supply and uh, natural storage, like uh, an old salt mine. Uh, coexist in place and all you have to do is put excessive renewables there that you're going to build anyway and renewables should always be excessive and then when you do have a renewable let you use it to electrolyze the hydrogen and it makes a big gassy battery. Well, so, and Jeffrey did go through that too. He talked about green and blue and he said that it takes a lot of energy to do all this conversion and you have to make the energy to do that conversion no, you don't. You use the sun. 
or the wind. You only use, you, you constrain it to what you can do with excess removal. So and he was he was definitely doing a little both sides of them. I wasn't there up under the transcript. And, and I'm just saying that PRPA has been through those arguments and their um, goal of uh, using a turbine architecture that has uh, a replaceable fuel train essentially or track uh, so that when material science gets a little smarter about hydrogen um, the, the plant can convert to be hydrogen burning is a completely re uh, reasonable thing and that yeah it probably won't be viable until 2035 or 2040 but we're not a hundred years away from it I know you would like to believe that but we're not uh, so, uh, so I just want to say that um, Jeffrey did talk about this and he said that you can use solar to convert hydrogen but you can't do it in scale. It takes a lot of energy and storage is still problematic. We don't have, I think that the main point that Ethan has brought up in this letter is that um, PRPA does not look like they have a plan for a dot com. Dot com. Um, and planning on hydrogen, either green or blue, yeah, and that's widely optimistic. And I mean, you have to basically, in a dark home, replace 100% of your energy production. I think I appreciate, what I appreciated in the IRP was, was not what's framed in here, is that what PRP put together was exactly what you said, Mary Lynn, is that there's, there's a lot of rocks and hard spaces all over there, you know, they're trying to figure out. And when it came to specifically their analysis of green, energy, of green hydrogen, my interpretation is, is that's one of the technologies they have their eye on to solve the overwhelming issue, which is storage of electricity to fill um, to fill <laughs> to fill the gap that can occur at any point for any reason in the grid. And so I, I don't I, I think framing it as optimistic. That's not. I went back and reread it, and I, I don't see that in the original IRP. I, I, I don't see it as optimistic so much as you know Platte River. Um, preparing for the best scenario while also preparing for the worst scenario. And I think that's why they gave us the multiple portfolios to say if hydrogen doesn't come through on this, we have to be prepared to say we're gonna keep running natural gas, or we have to be prepared to put up the investment to build out more battery infrastructure, because that's our only other option for storing energy to bridge those divides. And so I see the options they presented towards us, as well as one, we, we have to take the coal plant offline and so in transitioning to this new gas, you know, you know, natural gas fuel source is being prepared for, you know, the fingers crossed, the probable likelihood that green hydrogen, you know, uh, hydrogen coal from electrolysis will be an option specifically for solving the energy storage problem, which is to go to your point that That's all of our energy problem. storage No, problem. it is not. That it, because, because the reason for converting to hydrogen is, I mean, yeah, you have a storage problem around hydrogen, but um, but the um, switching over from methane-based uh, turbine fuel to hydrogen is to squeeze out the last several percent of, of carbon emissions, not to get us through the dark calm. You can get through a dark calm with the extra uh, uh, turbine capacity, regardless of what fuels the turbine. And I thought the examples, I think the example of what happened in Texas, and that's mentioned in this letter, is a good exa example of, of the dark tongue threat because they're, you know, PR, uh, is already dealing with that issue because what happened in Texas is that they cut corners and didn't winterize their infrastructure. So 40% of that outage was purely because the ballots were frozen on natural gas, the windmills were frozen because they didn't winterize. They didn't take the advice of the expert and when I was in technology. And then the flip side of that was what compounded the problem is that they, the Texas utility isn't actually connected to any surrounding states utilities. And so they couldn't draw power from partners um, to, um, in the way that we do in the state of Colorado itself, Platte River does to, to mitigate those circumstances. And so that sort of event is not is something we're already working to resolve by one, taking care of our infrastructure the way we would, while also making sure that we are relying on our state partners and being partners to the other states to get through those events as well. So yes, the sun may not be shining in Colorado, 
Uh, but the sun is shining in Kansas, which, which we can pull. So, so. I, what I understand you're saying is that we get through a dark calm by pulling energy from the grid, not no, from producing ourselves. There are, there's many ways to do it. You know, they do have batteries that pull helium. And Daryl, I don't remember this, but I bet one of you two does. Uh, I think the fine print of the IRP, because of the lesson of Texas, uh, includes uh, adding some on site natural gas storage. Uh, you know, it's, it was, it's not emphasized because it's not in there. Um, gee, guys, look how cool all this equipment is, which is all they seem to be able to present about. But, um, uh, but I, but I, I, I recollect a conversation with Jason about adding on some, you know, uh, methane tanks are pretty easy, um, bare molecules. And so uh, I think that that is, is one of the things that they're doing to mitigate the Texas gas line freeze um, problem. So, um, you know, PRPA is conservative about climate change. You know, they were deniers as long as you possibly could be. Um, they're, um, they are not, they are really conservative about reliability. So. I, I don't think you can really make the case that this is an unreliable uh, design. What it is, is a, is a design that doesn't reach 100% by 2030. And yeah, that's what we think, you know, is, and, and, and I was the person who brought the 2030 resolution before council. So, um, you know, if I'm willing to defend this design and that, that you can't quite get there, um, without uh, um, putting a ridiculous amount of money on the backs of the ratepayers, then it's got to be true. Because I, you know, I do write up an interview with the president. Is it the case by Colorado regulation that coal plants have to be decommissioned by 2030? It's, um, every utility was required to provide a, a, a clean, energy plan with the state of Colorado and uh, enter into a contract. And I'm um, I'm not sure whether the, whether 2030 was the hard date or well, not. Well, there's greenhouse gas reduction goals that the state, state set that the PUC is regulating investor-owned utilities to reach 80% reduction by 2030. Municipal-owned utilities as Clap River is a cooperative utilities work could voluntarily opt in to providing a clean energy plan, which they did. Clean power plant plan, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. Which they did. And then there was essentially a, a clause which I think if it was done before I think January first of twenty twenty four, the state was essentially counting that toward something that's tangential, which is the SIP the state implementation plan for air quality, meaning air quality standards. And so as part of that, Platte River committed to retire Rawhide by 2029, which then the state included in their SIP, which is federally mandated to meet air quality standards. So we, we are now essentially bound by both state and federal regulations, and please correct me if I'm misspeaking to any of this, because there's complicating factors into that, for retiring those, that coal plant. So keeping coal, the coal plant open is, from my understanding, not Not an option. Yeah, and that was really good, Lisa. I mean, I, I could, that was elaborate, and I don't think that <laughs> very many of us could have come back close to getting it right. But yeah, a PRPA is bound pretty tightly to close Rawhide by 2030. It's a little unfortunate, although I see if it's already written into the air quality, uh, you know, projections that, that they're, it's locked up, that you can't keep it for backup. I mean, I went doing research over the last week about natural gas versus coal. Of course, as you know, because you mentioned methane, methane is a very huge heat trapper. But in the event of a of a of a, an issue, not even having it as backup, I hope that these guys have got this thing nailed because otherwise we're going to be in trouble. I, I will say, from an emissions standpoint, so all of all of the emissions. Um, 
CO2, methane, all of that gets rolled up into what we call metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And that is accounted for in the emissions of burning natural gas versus coal. And emissions from coal are still about two times higher than utilizing natural gas. And again, please jump in if I'm not speaking correctly, but I don't think you can run coal as backup. Like, I don't think that technology really works that way. Um, well, it's generally a base load generator, so once, you know, it takes a while for the coal generation to get up to speed, and then once you're there, you kind of leave it there, and you want to run it for a while to get the most efficient. So it's really not good for stop gap. Right. It's not good for a lot on off Yeah, and that's what they can do with the, the natural gas turbines, which they are projecting. And again, yeah, this is all projection, right? And there's a lot of things that are, you know, even in the next five to ten years that are going to change that... Turbines don't exist. Even do you feel that you mean um, those turbines don't exist? What? I'm sorry. Well, the turbines that can uh, be brought in, they haven't been, they haven't been created yet. The technology is there. I don't know. Whether it's oh, what? Turbines. And I noticed that here this says this references a combined cycle turbine. Has they did they change it or are they still proposing an arrow derivative? Still arrow derivative. Okay. An arrow derivative was combined cycle in the last iteration of the IRP. But they switched to arrow derivative um, in this one because of its uh, responsiveness characteristics and its efficiency running at different levels of capacity. And yes, they're proven. They're flying over our heads every day. Well, no, I'm talking about the, the hydrogen turbines at scale that would be needed. Well, hydrogen doesn't come into it. Hydrogen is, is a future emissions uh, reduction Ploy, but it has nothing to do with the way this system is designed to work. It's the same engine, right. if you will, right? It's just two different types of fuel, so you don't have to say, hey, we're going to use hydrogen now, we have to throw away the old engine to get new ones. It's kind of the same, same engine that can work on either fuel. So when hydrogen becomes commercially available and something that we can use, then Platte River can start converting to using the hydrogen. The new but the new technology for burning them. But the point here is that PRPA, Boulder County, Colorado, Longmont are pushing electrification based on future renewable technologies, while there's a plan that, if you read between the lines, is, is based on uh, primarily carbon based fuels and will be for a very long time. I mean, Ethan, do you, can you speak to the, to the dark calm issue? Well, I haven't been in private conversations with them, so I don't know if they have a plan that's not in the IRP, but I'm concerned about the IRP, and I didn't see that in the IRP. I was and curious they why. They said that's a fundamental requirement. That was the language that they use. It's a fundamental requirement to address dark home, and so it should be addressed in the IRP, in my opinion. And if there is a plan that they haven't written out, then I'd love to see it. Um, well, there's... I mean, at, at uh, uh, several of their listening sessions and presentations, they've actually presented pretty elaborate simulations um, for dark comms. Um, and uh, uh, the amount of capacity that, that they have um, should work. Um, they may have to add capacity in the 2030s or, or 2040s as electrification proceeds because um, it's not going very fast. I wish it were going faster. Um, I, you know, we all should wish it was going faster. Um, but um, you know, we're not we're not slated to um, go to a winter peak. I don't think this decade and winter peaks. Um, are, are when you are most likely to experience, uh, or winter is when you're most likely to experience a dark calm. So our winter peaks are low, um, and that 60 megaw 600 megawatts of gas capacity plus being in uh, an energy imbalance market um, and having you know, reserve requirements. Yeah, and, and reserve requirements uh, should be just fine. I would think you know, dark columns are their justification for building a new gas plant 
when everybody ideologically doesn't want to build it. That's why they're talking about dark policy. Um, it's not because they don't think they've got enough stuff um, to uh, to take care of it. You know, as long as they've got the rawhide, they don't have to worry about it at all. But they're talking, they're planning for the decommissioning of rawhide in the year 2029. Do you happen to know why? Um, I, I think they weren't required to do this report until next year. Um, and cons considering the fact that technology is changing by the minute, do, do you know why they they rushed to have it done in 2024? Did you say why they had things done in 2024? Yeah, I think the idea was you're right, there's a requirement to submit one every five years, but because of the sort of the rapid changing, um, rapidly changing landscape. Of technology, um, load growth, and sort of that sort of thing. They thought that having a more frequent uh, uh, IRP submit only made more sense. And they had, you didn't have to go five whole years before your next update. It's like, well, we can do it in three years or four years because we you know the upper chance it can be a little more responsive. So they may do another one in three or four years rather than waiting mm -hmm. five years. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's good to know. They change it up. We can even, you know, not out of the realm of possibility to say, wow, so much changed this year, we need to do another IRB in a year. It's unlikely, right? But I think that's some, that's the flexibility of the child. And this I would say, helpful. I think that there was some response to folks that have been pushing really hard for that removal goal was that that's the way for them to see that Pop River is taking that goal seriously. In five years, when we were talking about a 10 year time frame to get to 100%, a long time for folks to, to feel like they trusted that Flat River was doing what they were being asked to do from the over communities and some of high schools. So there is an accountability piece to make sure that they are continuously evaluating the technology as it changes and the cost as they change and all of those sorts of things. It does put us, I think, to Mary's point earlier, in that kind of rock and a hard place because Flat River is really is out in front of a lot of this and we are trying to make these decisions in a time frame that that adheres to both state mandates and local goals and responsive to you know the community that has set those goals and, and i would say too um utilities because of the nature of the investment that they have to make especially any investment that's related to changing operations um, you know, it's not a decision that you make in a year and next year you're up and running. Uh, you know, they, they have to be able to project out their reserve capacity in order to participate in the market, which is a very conservative thing that they have to achieve. And also, they have to get in line to buy the equipment that's going to do the things that they say they're going to do to maintain reliability. And, um, you know, sort of, it's this push me, pull you up, hurry up, but, but it takes a long time, you yeah. know. And that's, I was waiting for you to get to that one. For whatever you get to that one, this when they were first presented the, the rough sketch of this IRP to council, which was in 2023, um, the main reason that they wanted to rush into the aero derivative turbine was because the permitting process and construction process is long. Um, and so that's why, that's, that's the most concrete substantive reason for pulling this IRP in. Um, but aeroderivative turbines are, are absolutely proven technology. There's there's no... Um, the, so connecting it to the burning of the um, hydrogen that has not been proven. Right, and yeah. That we aren't close to it, according to, I mean, I read about mm -hmm. Google Beyond Jeffrey Ellis, who I haven't seen any path that's laid out that looks like it's 10 years ago. Well, the, you're talking about commercialization. You know, the the thing that they're building in the, the thing they're building in in Little Colorado is also not, which is uh, uh, iron, the rust battery batteries, um, and uh, that's not commercializable for a, for by by a long shot, but it works. And that's the state of, you know, there's the, the 
place that I can't name where they're really they're building a hydrogen combustion system on Utah. Utah. Might be Utah. Again, it's not commercially viable, but if it's done by a large governmental agency or or public utility, it doesn't have to be commercially viable. It just has to work. And so you know you can't um, uh, make that that you have to not make you have to make that distinction. And it is one of the reasons why PRPA can't get out as far over their skis as Excel does. Is if, it, is it, if Excel invests in uh, something uh, really risky, um, like iron-based batteries, um, then uh, if it fails, they've got a lot of other backup resources around. PRPA is not just enough. Um, and so, you know, they're not going to build one of those yet. They have to wait until it's, you know, in Mary's term, more um, commercially usual, and where a lot of the cost is driven out of it. And that's what, what, what we were saying at NOAA about, about use of, of uh, green hydrogen as a fuel. Everybody, it, it's, it's really simple. You, you know, every, every step in um, sorry, every step in that process is really simple. It's just a few of them leak. You know, it takes a lot of energy. Pardon me. It takes a lot of energy. No, the energy thing isn't this. It, that's that's truly a red herring. I mean, yeah, sure you wouldn't you wouldn't burn coal to electrolyze hydrogen. You'd have to you'd have to have some way to get it for free, um, you know. That again, I'm sorry, but he was indul indulging in both sidesism at that point. You don't you don't generate you don't electrolyze hydrogen um, using a more expensive, less efficient fuel. You just don't. Um, but yeah, it would take a lot of energy to do that if you were going to. So you would electrolyze the hydrogen by burning gas? No, you electrolyze the hydrogen by uh, slice you excess solar. But you're not going to have enough capacity. So no, you, there's, there's not so enough built into any of the plants that they offer us. And so there's the IRP indicates that our renewable portfolio is enough and more to support our load. It's just that when those things aren't available during times of dark calm, we have to have something else. Right. So when all things are, are operating, the, the load is met. Yeah, but the, the other thing about solar is that it generates the most when you need it least. And, well, it does, yes, yeah. you know. And so um, at, that means that any uh, heavily invested system that uses a lot, a lot of solar at times has excess solar. You know, I mean, California revised all its business codes, the building codes, because um, they didn't really realize what a solar glut meant. And now they really have a solar glut. They have, they have more solar energy than they know what to do with. Um, and, and even PRPA will have times when there's too much solar. So when you've got too much solar, you can do other things with it. You know, charge batteries. You know, the IRP design includes we'll use we'll place these batteries so that we can charge them with solar or wind when we don't need the energy. And hydrogen electrolysis is exactly like that, and that's one of the reasons that it is more of a future because um, if you do that, it has to stay in the storage where you put it instead of leaking out. Um, so you know we need an advancement in materials science or a salt mine, and we don't have a salt mine, so um, we need an advancement in material science before that's practical for RPA. But it's not that it isn't going to work. I think the IRP actually addresses exactly what you're saying, Mary. On page, ugh, sorry, my eyes are at the end of the day. One ten on page one ten, there it specifically says that the study indicates there are no low or no carbon solutions to the dark calm thing. So that's why they're advising these, the different the different portfolios are advising using 
carbon source, so gas fired uh, combustion for dark calm. And then their expectation, or it's not even an expectation, what they indicate there is that what vendors are telling them is that we can start introducing up to 30% hydrogen into that mix starting in 2028. But the underlying portfolio is, as far as the reliability question goes, is if hydrogen does not pull through, the natural natural gas can continue. To okay. rise. That's right. So both of you are saying what I'm saying, everyone who's been saying what I'm saying, which is that, yeah, there's all of these contingencies for maybe storing some energy in green hydrogen and maybe using the sun for that. But um, there is, there's no path that I've seen that says that this is actually going to work anytime soon. And meanwhile, we're asking people to um, convert to electrification, which if you don't personally in your business or in your home, go to the uh, low energy usage heat pumps and retrofit your house to be a passive house, which hopefully um, Corquette and I will work on doing some co-work on that. If you don't do that, then you're paying more money. You're paying to have your heat for your house created from natural gas. So the electricity then has to go to your house to, to heat your house at a 70% loss. And the optimism in this, if, if we are focusing on electrification, we're making that forcing more and more and more electrification. Um, so Marcia, do you believe that nobody will ever be required to uh, put in a heat pump before the uh, electric electrification costs have gone down because we're using all renewables? This is well, the piece well, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, uh, Lisa, in 2016, I think, or so, you commissioned a study from that woman-owned business that was made by Lotus. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lotus, there you go. Um, and. I believe one of the things that was, I believe it was that document that said that the um, uh, electrification and um, electric vehicles and a lot of those electrification technologies start being better around 60%. From an, and from, yeah. yeah, from an emission standpoint, we've already surpassed that. Yeah. So from an emission standpoint, it is already cleaner to utilize electrification-based appliances rather than gas-based appliances. Mm -hmm. I will say that from the code requirement standpoint, we are talking about code requirements for new construction to be all electric. I don't think those two things are, I, I think there's some conflation happening between those two things because yes, we wanna do that as the grid gets cleaner, that transition from the grid getting cleaner, aside from the load forecasting to make sure we have the load to support that transition to electrification, doesn't have any bearing on folks actually using electric appliances versus gas appliances. At least, like I said, from an emission standpoint. I was talking about the cost of your home. So I will say from an efficient size, if you're still, um, if, it just seems like there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be stuck in a place where they they don't have a um, a really clean envelope for the house. Most of the house is a long laundry, like 50 to about 100 something years old, um, or maybe less now because a lot of building, but many. And um, if there's a, a requirement that you have to put a heat pump, you can't put in um, replace your gas uh, burner, then you're going to have people who are going to be paying who are going to be caught in this gap why we're pushing electrification, it just doesn't make sense. So I think I, go ahead. No, that's okay. So I, we go have ahead. programs underway that what, so that we've talked to you all before about the whole home health program being one. So I new construction, I'm not worried about that impact. The technology of cold climate heat pumps is very efficient as compared to gas furnaces and, and one of the money codes that go along with right the that increase the efficiency improve the so yes. we are considering the impacts when you're talking about retrofit because you are exactly right if you put the heat pump into a not very efficient home you have the potential to drive up somebody's electric bill 
we are doing those programs now so that we can understand what those impacts are. We connect, we tie them always with energy efficiency. So the first thing we do are building en building envelope improvements. And we are doing that so that we can understand all of that data. We can understand all of the cost implications such that if at some point there are code requirements that's, that look at retrofitting to say, when your furnace fails, you can no longer replace a gas furnace with a gas furnace, that we have everything in place to support people in that. We are trying to do all of these things at the same time to get us to that place. We're not ignoring the fact that that could be a costly improvement for folks. And as we work on the state level with Colorado Communities for Climate Action, there's a huge focus on what are the equity implications and the affordability implications as the state potentially is looking at building code requirements and and so we are doing our best to do all of those things we're not forcing electrification on existing buildings we are trying to look ahead to say how do we best prepare our community for these changes that may at some point happen so this is, well yeah but there's something because you were used the word conflate really early on in there and you need to understand if we're talking about a critique of the IRP you are not talking about home electrification because it's a different actor. Longmont Utilities, the city of the, I'm wait a minute, I'm Mary, let me finish the damn sentence. I'm talking about the larger picture version. So what we're talking about is, in fact, you've got the cart before the horse when it comes to PRPA because it was us pushing PRPA to make sure that they were expanding their capacities enough to, you know, if electrification went fast, is they were, we thought at some at earlier points that they were underestimating the speed at which electrification would advance. And that would have been bad because they wouldn't have had enough. Um, but uh, they aren't, uh, you know, they're, they're not pushing electrification, although they are with the board programs like efficiency work supporting it, um, but they're not pushing it and they're-, they're Well, they said they were in the, I mean, they did say that they're getting more and more involved in the electrification. They said that in the meeting when they presented But it's not in the IRP. They said it. They, they, I will clarify that, that is because the owner communities are putting money into things like That's efficiency right. works to incentivize that. That isn't Platte River pushing that. It's the, that's the owner community saying this is a priority for our community and we want to put our rebate money into rebating things like heat lamps. Yeah, that's so, what I'm making my point, but let's go on. Can I ask a question? So, uh, with the, um, so if I have a home that's using a furnace that's currently supplied gas by itself, mm -hmm. um, per, is, is there a, what is the per thermal cost difference if I swap in my heat pump. Does that make sense? It depends, yeah. That's yeah. Because it depends on right. the heat pump. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's what it's yes. Yeah, and then I do think, I mean, historically it has been cheaper to run gas appliances. Again, the efficiency yeah. of heat pumps is, is they're wildly efficient at this point in time. I think some of the other issues around gas is the volatility of gas prices. So, you know, that's, we don't control Excel's rates. Um, and then there's the question that's been brought up before about, you know, as more folks do transition to electrification, that leaves fewer and fewer folks to maintain gas infrastructure. Um, you know, the, those are all pieces that we are doing our best to take into yeah. consideration as we're doing all this. One I think too is that, especially in Colorado, is that we're starting to see the emerging research that the transportation from of methane to households is significantly leakier than we thought it was. And so the emissions of any household gas appliances is significantly higher than we thought it was. And we're just beginning to. The leakage has uh, been greatly underestimated. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not like that was one of the things. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute did a study on that that mm -hmm. shows that that's a very significant. Yeah, yeah. and then you get like the public health implications also. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, they're kind of fun. I mean, it's, like, it's cool science, but it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, 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 if you want proof about that, 
Excel Energy will subsidize your electrification plan by paying for, for a home energy analysis and stuff. They know. They want to add gas. Yeah. They're, afraid of they're, they're, they're yeah. already laying the groundwork for their transition out of gas. It sounds like the many of you have been involved in this for a long time, and this was new to me. What was the first IRP that I heard? Are pretty confident. Uh, you know, I came in pretty uh, concerned having looked at some some of the information that we've been looking at. But you guys have a lot of uh, have your feet into this pretty, and I respect you know your your perspectives on this. And and you know, Marcia, you feel, and Lisa, you feel that that they're not greatly overestimating, and we're not going to wind up in the soup. No, I don't think they are. Uh, I. I thought they were had uh, the what was it 2022 might have been 20 yeah 20 2020 the last IRP was 20 yeah. yeah with the last IRP um, I thought it was under modeled and and much more conservative and that they had invested earlier in their renewables they wouldn't have been caught. Um, by the supply chain disruptions from the pandemic and they would have more assets now. So, you know, people are really criticizing them by comparing them to Holy Cross, um, which did exactly that. They invested in renewables really early and so, you know, and now the microgrid system. And now instead of, you know, so PRPA, when they finish the new list of solar is going to be around 50%, that roughly, and Holy Cross is already up at 75 or 80, uh, and they exaggerated. It's not, you know, it's not as good as they say it is, but it is about 75 or 80 because they invested in Earth. So, you know, it's, it is, um, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to critique PRPA for being too aggressive. They're the opposite of too aggressive. I think it's hard about in this. And I think what's I think, important with communicating with the public is one, the issues of, of what it's going to cost um, to, to do this transition that has to happen. We can't economically afford not to make this transition happen. But I think with communicating with the public is that in a situation where it just isn't. We have solutions, but things are changing so quickly. There's so many unknowns that it is this just. There, there may not be, the perfect can't be the the good here, and that's what I read in the, in the, in the IRP most of all, is that they're doing these wide ranging forecasts of saying the best case scenario, here's where we are in the worst case scenario, here we are by just five years from now, these forecasts, the difference. And so in many ways, I think what I appreciate what you're saying, Lisa, with you know, just the electrification plans, is that so much of the sustainability work just means to taking the best step we can moment by moment, evaluating moment by moment. And, and as they were saying, is if we need to revisit the IRP in two years, we have to revisit in two years. So we're only writing what we know now, and what we know is green hydrogen isn't an option, but it might be, so we should prepare for it in case it does, because 10 years from now, if we aren't prepared for green hydrogen, and that's the solution, we'll be we're in trouble. trouble. Yeah, so that's when we're really in trouble, uh, when natural gas packs up and goes home, and we can't we can't move to the green hydrogen or we can't move to a full battery infrastructure. And so I think that's I think that's one of the harder parts. And I don't know what the answer is, mm -hmm. uh, but with from you know from the from city council standpoint and the city standpoint is how we can start to have these conversations with the public about how how truly challenging the transition is going to be for the next 10 years. Well um, I also yeah. looking at it in terms of the geopolitical situation, um, the only way we're going to have enough natural gas is if we're going to continue fracking and fracking more because uh, gas is highly volatile. Russia is, um, you know, been cast as an as an enemy, and we're actively acting like Russia is an enemy. Um, we really needed to uh, most of the countries in South America that could be supplying us with resources. So what I see is a situation where all of the um, the renewables. Um, DRP said it become really expensive. They can't meet the, the goals that they wanted to because most of them, you know, the, the uh, solar is being made in China and that stuff is more expensive now than it was when they were uh, making the projections of the last IRP. And um, 
I just see that we're going to electrify and have to create more electricity to meet the needs and um, we're going to have to frack to meet that so the fracking electrification is in the, at least the short term going to cause more fracking and that's just isn't fun for me so whatever um, you know, it's hard to argue that we have to stop fracking so we shouldn't engage in any resource about in any resource about research about green hydrogen all the research should have this it's just the planning on it or the even putting it in a plan it just seems like it's confusing the issue so uh, it's not in the plan you know, that is that is there as it was a requirement for the manufacturers that they have a plan to convert their devices gradually and that is you know so it was a, it was a requirement in our um, uh, RFP for smart meters uh, that fiber backhaul was at least considered in the roadmap of the provider because we have people who don't like radios um, and we have uh, a really robust underground fiber infrastructure in this city and so you put in requirements in your plan for the future because that's how engineering works but that does not in any way mean that the efficacy of this IRP depends on green hydrogen ever becoming practical because it doesn't keep your options open right so yes yeah, keep your yeah. options open and you make more regrets decisions today and say, well, we can turn left, we can turn right. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I also think it's important to, um, to Mark, Mark, what you were saying, too, is the commercialization question. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this comes up in my professional work, is that, that this is an important signal for the commercialization aspect because the companies that are trying to create green hydrogen, they don't have a case if no one's producing plans, IRPs, that say, we're looking at green hydrogen as an option. So it's a, it's a good thing for our, for Northern Colorado, even for our economy, that we're signaling to all the green researchers, green hydrogen technologies out there to say, no, we're looking, you know, this is a community that's where we welcome you to work with you, and that is something we'd like you to work on, and that opens up funding offers. So, I mean, it's right there in grant applications to the government of, of what is the potential for this, and you say, well, look, Fiber IRP says they want 30% hydrogen by 2030, um, so give us that $2 million grant so we can get to work on that. Mm -hmm. Because except for except for some missing advances in material science, the rawhide site Design. is perfect for a green hydrogen system. You know, it's got places to put solar panels. It's got an overabundance of water for electrolysis. Um, Trick drugs. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's got everything you want except a place except a solar. In short of that, there's the battery research that's happening too. Yeah. So there's all sorts of battery research that's coming out. I mean, it's just, we have to have all our fingers in all the pots. Yeah. Because hopefully one of them has the honey. Yeah. And IRPs are specifically, the nature of the, the proposal is no matter what happens, this will get, will keep the lights on. It's not that they're claiming it's the best possible thing. In fact, they, they always say we want to encourage a conservative solution, um, which is why we're arguing so hard about saying you know, that the mention of some piece of technology or another is, makes the plan risky. You know, the plan, it doesn't make the plan risky because the plan doesn't depend on it. Just because it allows for it doesn't mean it depends on it. Address the chair. I wonder if we are at a position. Uh, I don't want to cut off any discussion, but I'm just wondering at this point whether someone wants to make a motion. Um, uh, if someone has more information they think they need. I feel like, now that we've been talking about it for an hour. I'm yeah, I, I, I just wonder if someone wants to put a motion on the floor to. Uh, I'm just suggesting we move this to the point of yeah. a motion. I just want to say vote. before the motion that. Um, my opinion of it is that I just have a hard time with the letter as a committee being like this is our opinion this is our voice as one I think that we are 
the public ourselves so we can have our own opinion so I do think like there's the public event to be heard for city council but I just have a hard time with the letter saying this is our opinion as a board Well, uh, first of all, thank you. To, at least you created this discussion. Uh, this was very helpful. I'm not an energy expert either. And what I'm hearing uh, from the staff and you, Marsha, that you have confidence in IRP. And as that, uh, even though I see a lot of effort here, my inclination right now is to really drop this and not spend council's time. Um, uh, in its present form, I would not support this letter. Um, if people want to go off and uh, you know get the errors out of it, right? Like, like it refers to a combined cycle gas turbine, which is just you know, that's four iterations ago um, in technology, um, and, or the idea that it depends on hydrogen, or that it requires that one adopts electrification. You know, so those things are removed from it. Um, then you could come up with a shorter recommendation that that might be appropriate for. Uh, presenting to council, and I'm saying this because I always encourage my boards to wield their power by presenting resolutions to council. Um, however, I, I were encouraging this group to present a resolution. It would be about building efficiency and not about the IRP. And I'll tell you without going technical, it's really hard for me to make Notice that the not being technical is hard, but um, the better we do at building efficiency, and you guys get ready to nod here, the more influence we have over IR over PRPA. The better we are at building efficiency, because it diminishes our peaks. It, it allows us to use energy when we choose, as opposed to when we have to. You know, so let's work on that and let's push the council to, um, you know, to work on building efficiency, which is actually a problem that we have much more power to, to do things with. And there's a lot more public fear of, about what are they going to make us do. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the United States and we don't really have much power to make people do much. You know, you can sit in a cold house and never put a UPAM pump in. We can't make you do it. And, um, uh, but we can really encourage you and help you do the things that will um, make you more comfortable in your home, whether or not you choose to electrify. That's what I think I would recommend that this board focus on. Um, if you're going to focus on monitoring IRP, um, you're late for this one, you know. So they will. It takes two years minimum to do that a credible job on an IRP. And so get ready, those of you especially who have time on your terms, get ready to start bird dogging the next one. But this one's, this one's set in stone and Whatever you don't like about it, it's not bad enough to try to pull it back and blast in it. It's my two cents. Focus on building efficiency. <coughs> Which There's, market does know a lot about. <laughs> I think there is other things too that if we decide not to pursue this, that like I know the water efficiency is in the works right now that we can actually have some opinions on that and get that um, building efficiencies and things like that, but it's all into what we wrote on, what we decided. So it wants to. I'll make a motion. 
motion not to present this to the uh, city council. I'll second that. Assuming that's phrase, but to get to Ms. Lyle. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then second. <laughs> um, so all those in favor of not sending the letter? It's painful. I appreciate all the discussion. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stay because I think we need to make a motion that you maybe do it best. All right, so that motion um, passed or carried for um, a four, four, one opposed, and one abstain. So. Have other motions on this subject. Yeah, I think the motion was that um, not to present the letter to the city council. Well, you put it sure. I'm sorry, I was just saying thanks to Francie and showing up. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, it would be in order to still have a motion to revise the letter, right? This letter has been voted not to be presented to council. So I just, I'm trying to. It depends on what the um, market meant by his motion. I mean, was it any letter? No, or just, just this this letter? this letter? Okay. So. As far as the board is concerned, I mean, I think that's important too. Of course, it's still, it's still the still free to send this to city council to share with city council. Um, just give public comment. So that's that's good too. Is that we're not we can't stop an individual discussion of the papers and the debts. But I think it's also, I mean, I'm stating your point. To what you were, what I've been chewing on is when you had said that this was first the first draft of this was presented to city council in 2023. Uh, so that was last year. Is I think you know, if this is if this, if this is of significant interest. Um, I also see Platt River Utility um, holding regular community listening sessions. They were at the recent electrified lawn lawn fair um, fun table, uh, and so I think there's also a lot of opportunities to, to as you said, to bird dog <laughs> mm -hmm. um, IRP uh, you know, the uh, Platt River going forward as well. In, in addition to that, you could point someone. Platte River Power Authority's board meetings are uh, live streamed. And um, this summer has been the first time since I've been on council that I haven't watched the live stream of at least 75% of those board meetings. Um, so it would be a perfectly appropriate thing for this board to do going forward and I think we would have a, a much deeper understanding of what goes into this. And be involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's good security. <coughs> I'll be honest, you know, having spoken to the folks at my member through the process, you know, they may, they may not pick up on it, but they really do welcome the input. And they, they'd like to hear from people have the questions so that they have the opportunity to say, well, here's what we found, here are the responses for. Wow, that's a great question. We never thought of that before. Let us circle back with you know our PhDs and our consultants to, to figure out the response to that question because that's something that hasn't come up before. So I think honestly they would prefer to have more involvement and more input, and more questions uh, through the process. Hey Mayda. He painted themselves into the corner a little bit on public involvement because they funded this huge public engagement center in Fort Collins, which as you know, notice is not in the public service area. Um, and now they want to have all their dog and pony shows up there, <coughs> which makes it pretty tough on Estes Park and Longmont. But um, 
especially in the summertime, it's a nice drive to go up there and and attend those. And, and if you have made the effort to go up there, as as Gerald said, they you know, you really do have a, a lot of um, opportunities for one on one there, and they're all much smarter than they look in terms of their presentation skills. You know, I was just beating my head against the wall because the suit didn't, didn't say anything about the constraints. And it was clear from you guys questioning when he was presenting that you didn't understand that the new gas plant wasn't base load. And, you know, um, what else? There was some other thing that was, oh, you know, that there, was, there were regulatory requirements to reduce carbon emissions that PRPA doesn't get to choose about. Um, you know, he should have said that and he didn't. Um, but it's also not true if you go get to know them. They do know it. Their, their skill gap is in figuring out what you do. I think they're also very willing to come and talk to whoever wants to ask questions. You know, it was kind of an open invitation for the talk past 12 months. If you have groups <coughs> that want to know about this, let us know and we'll be sure and come and talk with them. And we did have a number of organizations that reached out and said, well, yeah, we'd love to hear more about this. So, um, you know, so I think, I think they're, they're open and want to have, want to have that interaction. Um, and I think we probably in Longmont requested more of those opportunities than others because we felt like there was an interest here. Mm -hmm. And because it was a long drive. Okay. Um, so then we have items from the board. Mary, did you have Yeah. I have two short ones. Can I just put them I wanted to give an update on the front range uh, collaboration. The steering committee uh, has been meeting and uh, is finalizing the book. Just to explain what this is, so Westminster's uh, Environmental Board, Sustainability Board, created this initiative to coordinate with, with boards like ours across the front range. And we had probably had a meeting back, it's probably been six, eight months ago, that they were maybe. Um, 10 or 12 uh, different communities that, uh, that participated in it. And there's a steering committee, I'm participating in the steering committee. And right now we are finalizing a draft of mission, vision, goals, and priorities for the group. It's one thing I've been pushing for is to bring this into focus. There's interest uh, and energy, but nobody exactly knows what's going on. And so we need to give some, we need to give some structure to this so people know if they want to plug in and be able to coordinate sustainability, environmental issues between the communities. Um, and the Boulder Environmental Advisory Board is going to host a meeting uh, on November 12th, um, and that would be the next uh, the next meeting. And uh, a survey was done of all the people that attended, and the focus seems to be on water resilience. And they are arranging for two speakers to come to that meeting. So far, there's no requirements or restrictions on who comes. So if anybody wants to come to that November 12th meeting in Boulder, they're welcome to do that. And the two speakers that they're trying to arrange uh, are the water chief of the state of Colorado and a representative from the water utilities department. Oh, so I'm it looks just like curious. Sorry, if if we do go, if there's more than three of us yeah but. you just have to um put a notice out that lets people know that you guys will there will be more than uh two members there and um you'll be discussing things but you won't be voting on anything as a board so there's no problem i'll make sure i'm not sure if you guys are getting everything i know you were but i'll just i haven't gotten anything for a while okay so, so um i'll make sure to forward to mm -hmm. you and to okay. you so yeah. that you can let the board know on this but i think by next week they're going to send out, we've got people that are working that's going to send out a save the day thing, and then we'll have the official information where it is and what the time is going to be. You said it's on water, what was this one? On? Uh, it looks like the private, from, from all the people that attended the very first meeting and sending out this poll as POL.S, which I wasn't familiar with survey, 
uh, they were able to determine that the highest priority seemed to be water uh, water issues. So okay. um, that's what they're going to be focusing on. In that and then the other thing, uh, very quickly, for those that were on the board uh, back two years ago, you may remember that uh, Public Service Officer David Kennedy came and spoke about the sound camera technology uh, for uh, noise issues of very loud vehicles and, and that sort of thing. And this was of personal interest to me, so I checked in with him to find out what had happened with that. And he said basically the technology has not developed far enough along so they can say, oh, it was that car. That was the problem. And so they're still interested in this. There is a regulation about vehicle noise for non-commercial vehicles. Um, you're not supposed to be able to hear it from 300 feet away. There's probably 10,000 cars in this town that don't meet that requirement. But anyway, they're still looking into this, but uh, at this time, the technology is not advanced enough that they feel that they can do anything with it. So this was of interest to me, so I thought I'd just refer to those who were that presentation when, when the officer Kennedy came and gave the presentation. I just want to say that um, Rachel Meth, who is, I can never remember the actual name, but he's a neighborhood resource coordinator. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and um, he runs the little, um, uh, the, the, um, the neighborhood, neighborhood solutions. Just tell me the names. Yeah. And so, the neighborhood solutions um, committee. I'm on that. And um, it's a committee, sort of, of committees that uh, looks at applications from. Um, the NGLAs, the neighborhoods that are NGLA members, um, to get some grant money to uh, to improve the sustainability of their neighborhood. And so far, um, there's been two meetings since I've been on the board, and there's been an application for both of them. And the it looks like he's giving them good guidance because they had good applications, which met all the requirements and. Um, I was not able to go to the meeting yesterday, but Wayne has it set up so that you can do an online mm -hmm. uh, review of the application, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that they passed that one as well. So I haven't heard, but it sounded like it was yeah. pretty solid. So yeah. So mm -hmm. so uh, everyone so far has the two applications. It sounds like there's other folks in the work. <coughs> there are in existing neighborhoods with existing uh, landscaping schemes and existing HOAs. And so far, they've been getting some cash to pay landscape architects to help them to figure out a scheme that is more ecologically contiguous with our ecosystem. The first one I had a big objection to because there was a big chunk of area that was just rock, which um, is not an ecologically sustainable idea, but um, everyone in the committee agreed. And the next one didn't have that in it. Um, everyone agreed that that's not a good idea because that's not you know, the way rock occurs in nature, plants grow in it and so forth, and you can't maintain it. I've never you know, seen landscape, you know, it's just one of it's just rock without spraying poisons in it, and it causes heat island effect and so forth. Yeah, yeah so, um, so I suspect that over time we will see more of our neighborhoods, and we have 60 members of the NGLA. Mm, I think, yeah, somewhere around there. But a lot, <coughs> maybe that many more neighborhoods, or half as many more. That About half as many more, I think. Yeah, half as many more. So we could have ninety. So mm -hmm. if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have um, an NGLA membership, I'm working with one, another neighborhood contiguous with ours, Kensington, to help them get theirs started. Yeah. That's um, got a lot of the the, the lower income. Um, single-family home and apartment dwelling folks. Um, I think it's just a good thing to be aware of in the neighbor in the in the city and to get involved in that um, in the NGLA if you can. Is there a list of neighborhoods somewhere? Because you know I've asked oh, so many times and I've so. never found it. Yeah, because it's it kind of fluctuates. Um, but one of the things that I think is really cool and pretty unique mm -hmm. about the neighborhood group leaders and association is it's not exclusive to HOAs. So it's any registered neighborhood group. So it can be a group of neighbors that get together and say, you know, we are representing this neighborhood and all they have to do is register with the NGLA. So it's the, the representation is much more broad than a traditional like homeowners association. There are HOAs that are part of it, but it's and much more neighborhoods that are members of the NGLA, but the HOA isn't, isn't actually the representative. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so it's not, yeah, so there can be HOAs yeah. that are part of it. Yeah. Sometimes HOAs are like almost whole neighborhood districts unto themselves. Yeah. So, but yeah, so it's 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 a really unique group that I think um, is has been going for 30 or 40 years now, so. Um, yeah. There's a grant there. Um, so the, the grant deadlines, um, this was the last one for this year, and they're every two months. It's uh, February is the next, then April, then June, then August, and then October. So it's every two months, and uh, the applications are pretty, the applications are pretty simple. They're kind of painless. Yeah. And, and it's under the whole, the broad umbrella of sustainability. So if you... It doesn't have to be your landscaping. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we've had folks do um, grain barrel workshops. Education is a focus. Mm -hmm. Workshops. Yeah, there's a couple buckets that you can apply for, but really under anything under that broad umbrella of sustainability, folks can come forward with for money for their neighborhood. If your neighborhood really gets it together, you can get up to fifteen thousand dollars for a really serious and involved project that's going to make a significant impact. So it's something that's worth looking into and looking. Um, quickly, I, I mean, maybe skipped out of the items from staff. I just wanted to let folks know that we are, so our building services folks are going to city council on November 12th, unless it gets pushed on if you've heard of anything with National League of Cities. We heard that maybe right. things would get pushed if that gets canceled, but I don't. Yeah, I, I uh, don't know. Okay, so most likely um, to talk about the building code update. So it's an initial discussion with city council to get some direction from them on, on which, what they want to pursue potentially around building electrification and either code options or other ways to incentivize building electrification. Susan and I will be there to support building services in that, but because it's, especially before it's, before our next meeting, I just wanted to let you all know that that was happening and then we will be depending on what direction we get from council on that, engaging with you all to help inform what some of those folks look like and the regional code cohort that we've been participating. What was the date of that? Is that November, November 12th. Yeah. So probably. Probably, yeah. yes. So probably. Yeah. So. I know, it's the other, yeah. You gotta choose. You, gotta, you, gotta choose. Um, you might get a free meal if you go down the bowl. <laughs> So, so you know, yeah, and another thing looks like the way things are going is um, that the cities who were really uh, far ahead in terms of forcing people to electrify are losing in the courts. So um, we are probably going to be looking more at incentives um, and uh, education and. Uh, Figuring out how much money you save if you do, if, you know, if you invest in, in, in these, all those things, and not, you know, you can't sell a gas furnace in the city of Longmont anymore. Not going to do that. Um, you know what? What will it might be cheaper to replace your existing HVAC with uh, with uh, heat pump technology. Mm -hmm. uh, because it will help you, um, or cheaper because your permitting fees will be lower, or you know those kinds of things the city can do. Then probably not to force anybody to do it. Is there the app or tell what the appetite is on city council for more stringent design coding of new construction? Um, you know, specifically at our last meeting we talked about passive, passive solar design, um, but I'm even thinking you know you look at natural disaster zones where there's a movement to, to make sure new construction is more resilient for expected disasters. So in Florida it's you know raising the foundation, being prepared for hurricane winds, but you know in Longmont it's everything from passive solar design to more resilience to grass and um, uh, grass and uh, forest fires. Um, I'm just wondering if there's an appetite because I know that drives up its the cost um, for new construction. Um. There, we do things that drive up cost for construction. So, for example, if a, a multifamily building above a certain number of units has to have sprinklers in it, right? Um, and they're 
were, there was a council member at least who voted against that because she didn't want to drive up the cost of housing um, and didn't believe in making developers do things. Um, but uh, in general, it was certainly never codified passive building design because there are other, as, as our speaker, was it last month? last month, wasn't it? September, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what month Yeah, this is. <laughs> this is late in October. Um, yeah. He said there are many flavors of design techniques to improve building envelopes and passive solar is, and I'm saying this solar because to distinguish it from other kinds of building efficiency, um, you know, we're not making you choose one, but uh, and this is happening all around me in New York right now. Um, you, you go to multifamily buildings and there's a big, big sign there that gives the efficiency rating of the mm -hmm. building. You know, so my building, for example, has an 84% efficiency rating, which is really good. You know, I don't know if anybody ever can spend the money to get into the 90s. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, but, but they're, they're required you know, to be on the side. So that's uh, many kinds of incentives. I don't know whether you get tax mm -hmm. incentives and things like that, but if somebody's apartment shopping, they're gonna know that a high number on that building means that their utility bills are gonna be lower and they're gonna have to, they're, they're gonna be more comfortable inside their, inside their building. Um, so uh, there are ways that um, municipal governments can make it a good choice to do the right thing um, without forcing. And I think that's where, the, where it's gonna go. But it should be a real interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. I should have held that for the <laughs> council. I'm so chaotic about these things. Um, he couldn't be here today. Um, we, we have a would-be guest who wanted to come and say this is public invited to be heard. Um, that you know he likes the idea of free but really skilled local presentations from local experts who are willing to present for free, like um, building envelope guy whose name I've forgotten. Michael, Michael. Terrible. Yes, Michael thank you. I was like, no, yeah, the, yeah, the name last yeah. name. I'm sorry, he's a friend of yours. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And this guy's a friend of mine, but uh, he is a consultant to city government. And he's helped cities evaluate multiple IRPs and um, would I like to come give a presentation on um, Understanding these processes, I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand what his focus is going to be, but he's really into uh, understanding the regulatory environment for energy, um, and you know, which I, I was mad at Sue for not um, explaining that, um, or Colorado for that matter, you know, um, and and so he is interested in knowing whether you all would like a presentation about the processes of you know of, of how things like the IRP happens and, and in, in the energy sector in, in specific. So um, I just wanted to get that percolating around because I think we maybe don't have the comfort level with processes that go on for such a, a long range. Um, so uh, he'll probably he's he's in I don't know somewhere Spring. in yeah yeah okay. yeah unless he went somewhere else yeah no no that's mm -hmm. that's where it is I just you know proper names are not my strongest suit how things work is much better for me to talk about but uh, but he's so he couldn't be here today but he might issue that um, uh, invitation in. Um, in person in an upcoming meeting. 
and next year would be a good time to start because PRPA will, you know, once they're through with negotiating with WAPA on this IRP, which is real soon now, right? Um, they'll just gonna start right back up. Um, so, you know, this uh, I think he can tell you a lot of things if you if you do want to start following the IRP process with PRPA. That's all we had. Someone wants to. I move that we adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.